Good afternoon. I'm Curtis Haymore. I'm president of the National Capital Area Skeptics. This is our meeting for April 24th, 2010. I'd like to thank J.D. Mack and Stage 2 Productions for providing the videotapes for this meeting. Today is a very special meeting. We're uh, honoring Ray Hyman today. Um, <clears throat> Ray Hyman is one of the world's leading skeptics. Uh, he's an authority in the study of deception, self-deception, and why people believe strange things. He has over 200 articles on these topics. Despite intense controversies, he is recognized as one of the most fair-minded skeptics, uh, and he's been able to maintain the respect of both parapsychologists and fellow skeptics. He's Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Oregon, where he taught since 1961. He was also a founding member of PSYCOP, if uh, those who know what the PSYCOP is, Committee for Scientific uh, investigation of claims of the paranormal. Did I get it right? Um, so uh, he was a founding member of that along with Philip Klass, who is, uh, this award is named after. Uh, and he's a member of CSI's Executive Council. Uh, from 1985 through 1991, uh, Ray Hyman served on the National Research Council Committee on Techniques for the Enhancement of Human Performance formed at the request of the U.S. Army Research Institute to evaluate human potential involving biofeedback, meditation, guided imagery, accelerated learning, and paranormal phenomenon. Uh, any of you who've read the book or seen the movie Men Who Stare at Goats, that's what we're talking about. So Ray was in, in the middle of that, and the story told me this morning, I hope comes out, how he helped uh, guide the author to the story. Um, in 1995, uh, Ray Hyman was one of the two expert reviewers on the American Institutes for Research panel conducted by the uh, Central Intelligence Agency to evaluate the Department of Defense Stargate program of remote <coughs> viewing. That's the ability, ability to describe locations one has not visited. Uh, his skeptical review of Stargate research was influential in the panel's conclusion that the results could not be unambiguously interpreted as supporting a paranormal phenomenon. In 1989, he founded the Skeptics Toolbox, so he's actually tried to translate a lot of his knowledge to other people. And this is an annual summer workshop offering attendees close and formal interaction with him and other faculty instructors while uh, tackling paranormal or science, uh, pseudoscientific case studies using the tools of scientific skepticism. In 2003, uh, Ray Hammond conducted a seminar workshop for us, our NCAST members here and guests, on the psychology of psychic readings. He's currently working on two books entitled How Smart People Go Wrong, Cognition and Human Error. And the second book is Parapsychology's Achilles Hill, Consistent Inconsistency. So he, we, he will be honored today. And what we are honoring him with is an award that is named after Philip J. Class. Uh, he died in 2005. Philip J. Class was one of the original conveners of NCAS in 1987 and was an important longtime mentor to our organization. In 1975, he, along with Carl Sagan, uh, Isaac Asimov, James Randi, uh, Ray Hyman, Martin Gardner, Paul Kurtz, and Sidney Hook, and others, was a founding member of PSYCOP, which is now called CSI. Class was a, a senior avionics, the senior avionics editor of Aviation Week and Space Technology, and he was known for explaining UFO sightings with pragmatic explanations. Although his detractors styled him as a debunker, in fact, debunking was the consequence, not the purpose of his efforts. He sought to investigate flying saucer reports and thus convert UFOs, unidentified flying objects, into IPOs, identified flying objects. He wrote several books on this, um, and he, we created this award in his honor in, in 2006, and the previous recipients had been Michael Shermer, James Randi, Robert Park, and Paul Kurtz. So Ray Hyman is obviously in the, uh, the pantheon of the greats of the skeptic movement, and I would like to present that word, word to him now. We'll just pull the cover off of this. So this is the award. Wow. So it's, it's quite nice. And we will ship it to you because it's sort of fragile to deal with. But anyhow, thank you so much. I Congratulations. I wondering how to get this through oh, security. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. You thank, you, thank you, Kevin.
So what we're going to do next is we're going to have Ray interviewed by DJ Grothy. And DJ Grothy is currently the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, which is a good friend of the NCAS organization. Uh, he's formerly a professional magician. He has special interests in the psychology of belief and processes of deception and self-deception. He hosts the radio show and podcast For Good Reason, prior to which he hosted over 200 episodes of the popular interview program Point of Inquiry, uh, which he and his partner Thomas Donnelly created in 2005. So let me introduce DJ Grothy. And I will turn it over to the two of them and uh, step back and listen to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Curtis, and congratulations, Ray, on the Philip J. Class Award. I think a good place to begin for uh, the exploration of your impact on skepticism is how does a, a young psychology student uh, get into this parapsychology racket? In other words, why you, not your colleagues? Why, what interested you early on, going 50 years ago, uh, to apply science to this burgeoning field? Actually, it goes back way beyond 60 years. Wow. Uh, I uh, did my first professional magic show at age seven. Uh, what happened was my father, for my birthday, gave me a few magic tricks. Mm -hmm. I took him to school to show and tell, and <coughs> I did the magic tricks, and the teacher said, that was cute, I guess. She said, would you want to do this for the Parent Teachers Association? I did, and they gave me $5. That was a long time ago, and that was a lot of money. <laughs> And uh, I was able to get a top hat with that $5, and a printer printed a lot of cards for me. And he called me the Merry Mystic, because I lived <laughs> on the Mystic River, apparently. So I was known as the Merry Mystic. I spread those cards all over the city of Everett, Massachusetts. That's where I was. Not a great city to uh, be, but it's a good city to be <laughs> from, OK? And um, I got hired by the uh, library for their story hour. and. And it went off from there. I, 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 it took off. So uh, I got books out of the library when I could read. And um, uh, I learned there was a guy named Houdini. Mm. And he was a favorite. He was a great magician. So, and he was a skeptic. He went around exposing spiritualists. I never heard of them before, but it's something I had to do because I'm a magician, right? Mm. A young magician. So I know at least from age 16, I never got to attend a seance. But I was able to go to, they used to have, all, all through the Boston area, uh, there were spiritual churches, and they would have uh, message readings. Mm -hmm. And you could come, and there would be someone stand at the podium, a visiting spiritualist or someone, and he would, people would write their questions, and they'd be collected in a box and then put in a, on, a, on a stage, and uh, he'd reach in and take out one of the folded slips and put it to his head and answer the question, mm -hmm. okay? And um, so I, I remember one of the meetings I was at, I was 16, I'm sure, at that time. And I was 16, and about the next in age to me, next closest would be about 60 to 70 years old. These were elderly people, uh, mostly elderly women and, mm -hmm. and some men uh, who were trying to reach the lost one. During this church service where yeah, the exactly. minister used the Q&A Act right. to inspire belief right. and spirit communication. And some of these people were pretty awful in their technique. And um, I remember there was one man who was doing this, and he was old, and he was lost his touch. He had a blindfold on, and he would grab the, the thing and put it to his head. But first, he opened it a little bit, and he <laughs> couldn't see too, too well, so he would hold, look it up. It was pretty obvious. <laughs> and I looked. I saw that all these people were going to see this, and they'd be very upset. But everyone was looking everywhere except at him. Mm. No one was looking at this guy. And a lady sitting beside me, a nice little old lady, uh, she was looking at the ceiling. I said, look, look at this guy. She said, she looked at me and then she looked behind her, but she would not look there. And I realized even at that young age that these people don't want to see mm. uh, this thing. Even though they're being obviously uh, being duped, they didn't want to see it. Mm. So I learned lessons like that uh, uh, as a kid. I, I went to a lot of those things.